It is July the 15th, 2022. And this was the week, Keith, that truth finally died, and you aren't too unhappy about that? Well, uh, yeah, that, it's an interesting thing, actually, in, in, in both your life and mine, the word truth, and certainly in the, in, in the last uh, four years in, in American uh, society in general, the word truth has been used as a weapon against almost anything that you disagree with uh, or one disagrees with. And um, it's a hard word to contest because truth is truth. What, what could possibly be bad about truth? And um, this week, uh, an essay was written um, uh, that I put into the newsletter uh, that I became aware of because of Bill Gurley. Bill Gurley tweeted, super important read, assuming anyone or any company can properly identify misinformation is both delusional and dangerous. And I, I clicked through, and there's this guy, Stephen Pinker. You might, do you know Stephen Pinker? <laughs> oh, I don't know. It. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, we all know him. Anyway, he's got this article, Misinformation is Here to Stay, and That's Okay. And what he focuses in on is that... Yeah, but that's not Pinker. Pinker's not uh, right. Isaac Isaac Swall is the writer, but Pinker linked to it. and that. So it's it's a good example of how Twitter works. You know, Gurley found out from Pinker. Pinker uh, uh, linked to the original. And you you end up here. And um, it's not a complex essay, but it's a very direct, well well said tome which simply makes the point that um, truth is um, uh, both in the eye of the beholder but also provisional and almost uh, and he makes the point that almost all truth is actually misinformation due to the fact that knowledge is going to get better and the truth that you thought was true today a year from now you will know it wasn't Obviously, we've all been through that with COVID. If you go yeah, back, yeah, I, I mean, I take the point, and it, it was an interesting essay. But what struck me was it, it's a bit of a straw man. I mean, I, nobody would argue with that. But which social network? I, I mean, maybe you know this stuff better than I do. I try not to follow it because it's too annoying. But which social networks are taking stuff down because they're saying it's lies? It's one thing to take it down if it's propaganda. It's one thing to take it down if it's hateful and inciting violence. But I don't know of any social networks that are taking content down because they say it isn't truthful. Well, I I think there's this spectrum between it's a lie and it isn't true. And they're not the same thing. Um, Well, give me an example of what's being taken down. Um. Uh, you know, I had a personal experience. I used to publish a magazine, and this is going way back. So I think this isn't a. No, but let's talk about so. Uh, let's talk about social media, Twitter, for example, or even Facebook. Well, They're not. Well, you know, uh, things were taken down that suggested that wearing masks didn't help. Yeah, well, that's. Yeah, I mean, that's who who who, who had stuff taken down. What was the example? Uh, who were the people? Well, they, Twitter claims that it takes a million things down every day. Um, so, I mean, we don't know, but it's a lot. And, and by the way, it's not specific, really. It's more that they've bought into their role. And that's why this is an interesting essay, by the way, because it's really about what should the role of Twitter be, and not just Twitter, but generally, what should the role be? They, they, they and I think we collectively as a society, have bought into the idea that there, that there has to be some arbiter of what's allowed. Um, usually it goes back to the terms and conditions that give the right of the entity to go and do that. Um, and what this guy, uh, um, Isaac Saul, is saying is, it's better to allow everything, but then allow the network to comment on it. Uh, and, 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 and you can put, you know, you can put metadata on a post that says, well, yeah. this isn't a you know, this isn't a real person. You can't trust this because because it's not a real person. Um, this is likely a bot. You know, uh, this is from a government agency. You know, so he's. But he's with been- Twitter, uh, you can. I mean, if you if you're willing to put the time in, you can do that yourself. I mean, all you do is click on the 
if yeah. someone's saying something, you yeah. click on it, and then it, yeah. well, I, any degree of media literacy, you should be able to figure out, well, this is probably a bot. I've never heard of this person. Does this person have any followers? Who is this person? Let me look them up. And if they don't exist, then it's probably propaganda of some sort. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, you know, I, 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 think, I think the general terrain is troublesome because it's pretty hard to avoid a point of view that says, I know better than you. And, and almost for sure, none of us know better than someone else on most things. Um, so basically, we're all encouraged to become uh, editors of stuff as opposed to um, um, pursuing ideas to make them better. You know, what he's really arguing for is, look, let's pursue ideas to make them better because that's what we do anyway as human beings. And let's not worry about all the rubbish that is the noise. Let's focus on um, ac yeah. ac acknowledging that most things are wrong. Then you're no longer scared of it because most things are wrong. Even, even known science is sometimes wrong. Um, and, and then let's focus on making things better, which is pro-science, pro-thinking, pro-engagement. And so it is yeah. a different of, of, of the future you would want. Yeah, I mean, the censorship... The censorship is troubling, I think. Uh, I mean, um, I agree with you in some ways. Although I, I do think that content that's... Whether or not it... You know, I, I'm just not sure if the truth thing is the way to a, determine whether or not you have an editorial policy on these platforms. So, for example content that's designed to encourage hate and violence has got nothing to do with truth it's simply do you want to have that which will have problematic social consequences so i don't know whether the truth thing is such a useful um i, I that was, he didn't use the word truth he he distinguished between misinformation and disinformation and, and what he was really trying to do was focus in on um, most things that are considered true are actually misinformation, not disinformation. Uh, disinformation is more of a aggressive, yeah. self-conscious attempt to disrupt um, through through lies, yeah. and that does happen. But misinformation is usually more benevolent. It's you think you know something, but actually the thing you think you know isn't actually true. It's just what you currently believe to be true. And well, it's everyone with, we all assume that we're living, as you say, I mean, this article says at a time where everything is known and we're certain of what we think, but we change our minds from one week to the next, from one month to the next, from one year to the next. So, Yeah, right? he, he uses the earth is flat thing. So I brought in this picture from the, uh, from the James Webb Space Telescope that came in this week, which... Um, you know, looks like a pretty crappy picture, but actually is yeah. doing something amazing. Which so what is, I mean, he makes the interesting point that most of the things we take for granted today in 50 or 100 years will be considered absurd. What, what do you think are the most um, vulnerable areas where our grandchildren or our great-great-grandchildren will look back at us and think, what were those people thinking? I think the, the biggest one is going to be the idea that, um, uh, you know, um, uh, that the, the, there's no such thing as society, that the, the individual, the sovereign individual. No one thinks that anymore, do they? Well, actually, my, my second set of stories all build on this idea of the sovereign individual. And, and I think the idea that we're just individuals and there's no society uh, in the future, things are going to be so interdependent and we're all going to rely on each other so much more even than we do today. And if you go back in the past, you know, and measure the past by how the extent to which we all depend on each other, over human history, we depend more and more and more on each other. Um, and yeah. and I, th I think that will continue to, into the future. And the idea of the unique individual, um, you know, Will 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 become uh, something that is seen as incredibly arrogant and egotistical. Egotistical. My, I, and I just actually wrote a piece, an essay on this, um, my weekly essay, 
uh, from my uh, Substack and on LitHub. I think that in 50 or 100 years, the thing that will have most changed is we'll be much more acutely sensitive as a species, both of other species and their perception of the nature of things, but also because of AI and smart machines of our own vulnerability as a species. And I think that AI is going to have a, a bigger and bigger impact on how we think of ourselves collectively. And that may be connected with what you're talking about as well, because I think one of the consequences of AI will be to think much more collectively and species like. Yeah, it's interesting. I was watching, uh, I watched Star Trek, um, the comedy version of Star Trek, the Orville. And in this, in last week's episode, there was this conversation about uh, food replication. And uh, the sentence was uttered, uh, uh, well, in our primitive past, when we used to kill other species for food. Right. <laughs> and I and, agree. I think that that area will be, I mean, just as we look back at slavery and the role of women, which is 50, 100, 150 years ago, we'll think in those terms about animals. Certainly, factory farming. Uh, I mean, uh, George Monbiot just got the Orwell Prize today for political journalism. I had him on my uh, keen on show about regenesis. I think rethinking the land, food, farming. I mean, you're heavily into that. So it's it's interesting. And also, what about geography and political states? Because you have an interesting, uh, in your Truth is Overrated section in the newsletter, Keith, you've got some interesting stuff on network states and nation states and how technology is going to change our idea of community and perhaps even undermine geography. And I think this, that may also be something in the future. Yeah. That will force us to rethink everything. I, I think certainly... This idea that all Americans should, because they live in the same territory, should think alike is also, I don't know if it's wrong, it's just absurd. I mean, just because you, well, I live in San Francisco and someone else lives in Montana or Arizona or Alabama, it, it, it means nothing and it shouldn't mean anything. We have nothing in common. We have nothing in common now and we will have nothing in common in the future. And the fact that we're part of the same political state, I think, will become also increasingly problematic. Yeah, well, so the, the, this essay is um, its so interesting because I've never seen anyone try to craft a point of view like this before. But if, if you remember back in the most controversial moments of Facebook, we, we you and I had conversations about the fact that there's 2.7 billion people using Facebook. And yeah. I, describe, I describe them, you know, in quotes as citizens. Um, and, and when Facebook was thinking of having its own cryptocurrency, um, talked about that being the currency of those citizens. And what this um, guy has done, uh, Balaji Srivanasan, is he's written a book, uh, which, by the way, is available for free. You go to his website here. Uh, you can read it online. Um, and uh, his book is called The Network State. And, uh, you know, it's worth reading just this brief thing. Uh, um, uh, can we use technology to start new cities or even countries? Um, yeah. And he doesn't literally mean cities or countries. He means human beings connected on networks that identify as part of the same thing. Uh, in his case, he assumes that that might be a philosophical basis, like people who yeah. don't eat animals might create a, a network nation, if you like, and start self-organizing to be able to not eat animals. So he, he, he imagines how technology impacts social and geopolitical structures. Yeah. Um, and, and it's a bit, a lot of it, it's, you know, impossible to agree with. Uh, he, he's a, he's a multifaceted person. He's so, somewhat religious, uh, somewhat, you know, uh, not, not, he's not a caricature of what you think the person would be that would write this book. Yeah. And then well, um, you, you, you compare it in, out, in some ways to Albert Wenger's uh, Life After Capital, which, or The World After Capital, which is similarly ambitious and similarly eclectic. Yeah. But then this really shocked me. Um, the founder of Ethereum, uh, Vitalik Buterin, wrote 
uh, you know, a book length essay in response. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, Ethereum is, is clearly um, structural to the whole world now. And, and so he's in a position to start to think about what the implications are of a global crypto currency and blockchain with computational abilities for the future of state. Uh, I, 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 it's impossible to summarize, but he disagrees with the with Balaji Srinivasan on a lot of things and agrees with him on others. It, 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 I have not read anything in this kind of space, apart from Albert, Albert's book, that has that level of abstraction and future thought in it, but as a practical matter, not a science fiction. Um, it's the kind of essay, I, Keith, that perhaps should have been published on Medium, which leads us to our, our next story. Ev Williams leaving Medium. Is that the end of Medium? I think I think it must it's be cool. the end. Is medium finish. Uh, I think Ev must think it is right because you don't leave something that's about to take off. So I think he's probably and and give him credit. He stuck with it for a long time and he's tried all kinds of product shifts. Uh, uh, medium is an extremely good environment. I publish the newsletter in Medium as a kind of a co-publishing every week as well. I have like 19,000 followers there. M.G. Siegler, who wrote the article this week about Medium uh, that I comment on, um, this is his piece, 500-ish um, is, his, is his Medium blog. And he makes the point that he has, um, you can see over here, 326,000 followers on Medium. So it's, it, it clearly is a platform that scales. It's bigger than Substack, I'm sure, by most definitions. It, it, um, it seems to have been eclipsed by Substack on so many levels. Why, why? I mean, there's a lot of people on Medium. Whether they're active is another question. I, I personally have always found it. Uh, I've never seen the point of it, whereas I can see I, the point of Substack. Yeah. I, I think what it comes down to is the individual entrepreneurs control freakishness. Um, medium is a is a kind of a um, is its own thing, and you live inside of it, and it clearly has its own policies and so on. Um, so you're choosing so it's like to a community. A community. It's one of your network communities of um, of writers. It is, but but with an overarching framework that is clearly medium with a capital M. Whereas Substack, there's no real overarching Substackishness about it. It's just there's you, there's me, there's other people. We can find each other. Uh, uh, um, they keep shipping new features that makes it better. Yeah. Well, Substack it's, allows you. The, the, I think the problem with medium is it doesn't encourage you to look outside medium. Substack is designed for writers who want to distribute their work in right. lots of different ways, and it and it's and it's simply designed and it works. Medium is is for all Ev Williams's commitment to openness and blah blah blah. It's a walled garden. It's a walled garden, um, and and um, not very not very feature rich for the modern creator. Um, yeah. So, and that's I mean, what, what I mean. Been, I mean, what have they that's, been doing for five or ten years? Well, that that's it's what I mean by millions of dollars into this thing. Where's the money gone? Well, that that that's what I mean by when, you you know yourself when you do a startup. Um, there, there there's a spectrum between building something open and building something heavily curated curated by yourself. Yeah. And I think Medium is on the heavily curated by Ev end of the spectrum. And Substack is on the, uh, here's some stuff, we'll leave it up to you what to do with it end of the spectrum. But what so Medium did, which I don't think worked, was employ, I don't know if they employed M.G. Siegler because he probably doesn't need the cash. They employed a lot of professional journalists. They still were trying to be a kind of electronic magazine. Yeah, Whereas Stephen, Substack, Stephen yeah, Stephen Levy, yeah. for example. Whereas Substack does invest in creatives, 
but not to create content, to sort of attach their brand with Substack. So it's a next generation model. Yeah, and it works, by the way. I, I watched uh, I watched Real Time with Bill Maher on HBO most Fridays, and his guests almost every week recently has had somebody that says, you know, author of blah, blah on Substack. And, and so the Substack brand is becoming... Um, you know, almost like an adjective. Yeah, well, your, was it your argument that most of the interesting work now is being done on Substack and not on in the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal? I, th I think that was true last week. I, I don't know that I'd yet make the claim that it's... Well, truth changes from week to week, Keith. We, we know that. I wonder, <laughs> I, I mean, these media platforms go out of style very quickly. It's like truth. So one wonders whether in two or three years, whether Substack will have gone the same way as Medium. I mean, look at your other story. A couple of years ago, you were telling me wow, how amazing Hopin was. And now that one's collapsed too. Well, it hasn't collapsed, but it's laid off 30% of its staff. Um, <laughs> it, it probably has a lot of money in the bank. Uh, I, I, the big question is how much revenue does it have uh, because it's in the virtual events business. Mm -hmm. And I, we all thought, and I probably still think, that virtual events um, are a natural partner to real events. So, you know, if you don't want to get on a plane and go to Barcelona for the Mobile World Congress, what would be the virtual Mobile World Congress that you could attend by staying at home? And hop into the company that should bring that to life. Well, this they they had their COVID moment, and now yeah. this is a post post COVID. I wonder with, I mean, these companies. The key thing is recognizing their power, and making acquisitions. I assume Hope and never really acquired anyone, did they? They did. They, were they, made, they, they acquired Streamyard, which is a competitor of Restream that we're using here. Um, I think they mm. made six acquisitions over the last two years. Um, so they, they do have revenue and they do have real tech, um, but now, now they're going to have to grow into their $7 billion valuation. $7 billion valuation in today's market probably implies you're close to a billion dollars of annual revenue. And they're yeah. not. So, um, and so think about that, that. You'd think they would make an interesting acquisition for, say, Zoom. They'd All make an interesting yeah, the business. I don't know who would acquire who. They're, I think they're too big to be acquired by a Zoom. I think a Microsoft could acquire them. A, you know, a Google could Without acquire really them. Without really death if Microsoft acquired them. A Salesforce I mean, could acquire they, them. Not a kiss of death. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, well, that story's not going away either. Speaking of startups, Keith... You've got a little startup of the week, a really small company that most people won't have heard of. Who are they? This is um, Apple as playing the role of live sports streamer, which uh, that, the, startup, the startup bit is the role they're playing. Um, they're, 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 the rumor is now out that they're likely going to get the rights to the NFL Sunday ticket, which is the biggest sports day in America. And apparently, considering a bid for the Champions League, Andrew, which you and I will care about. Um, well, I do. I don't know about you. I, no, I, I, I will next year. <laughs> That's an inside joke for the non-soccer non fans. Uh, Andrew's team, Tottenham Hotspur, is, is in the UEFA Champions League. And my team, Manchester United, who just beat Liverpool 4-0 in Bangkok, are not in the Champions League. Yeah, everyone wins 4-0 in Bangkok, Keith. That's an easy one. Except for Liverpool, apparently. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't get too excited about that. Uh, yeah, so, so, you, you, uh, you're, so you really think this is a, a significant move from Apple, this investment? I, I think it means that they understand how to win. Uh, live, live sports dominate. Like Manchester United. Yeah, it dominates fewer numbers. Um, if that's why they always put Manchester United on uh, on TV because whether they're second in the league or tenth, they draw a bigger crowd. So um, I think that Apple's learned that to get a big crowd, you've got to own the most watched sports. And, yeah, one um, piece of news you missed in this was the Microsoft Netflix deal. 
t talking of Microsoft. What what do you think yeah. of that? I think it's. I mean, just... it's, it's in the same area. Everyone, you know, all all, all the big players are. Yeah. Are, uh, are are trying to figure this one out. So. Well, there is, there's multiple facets to that deal. The, the first is Amazon historically has been a huge customer of Amazon. Uh, sorry, Netflix has been a huge customer of Amazon. So mm -hmm. the, the Amazon cloud is going to lose out to Microsoft's cloud for whatever Netflix and Microsoft are going to do. It's, it's probably not all of Netflix, but for whatever they're going to do together. Uh, so that's story number one. Story number two is it's all about advertising. Netflix was looking for a partner who could in, insert ads into the stream. Yeah. Um, and Microsoft has huge ad serving capabilities, which Netflix doesn't. Um, funnily enough, I watched um, the latest Bosch on Amazon Prime. Uh, Amazon have got a new service called Freebie, which is ad supported streaming. So it's doing what Netflix wants to do. And I thought it would yeah. be awful because I hate ads when I'm watching stuff. It turned out to be not too bad. They they basically took a two minutes twice during yeah, it's one. It's interesting hour. with ads. We we were watching a movie, and the only place we could find it was one of those networks which serve up ads, and it was really annoying. And then it suddenly, and and this comes back to your truth argument, I guess, about how things change so dramatically over time. I mean, ten or fifteen years ago, the idea of watching a movie without ads would have been unthinkable. So I don't. Yeah. We've suddenly become so, and I use this word carefully, intolerant to any kind of media that we think is somehow inappropriate or wrong. Where, you know, you know in the past, ads pay for the content. That was just the nature of it. So maybe yeah. we'll go back to that. I don't know about you. I was you. talking to my son about Apple yesterday. He said to me, because well, uh, he's a big admirer of Jobs and Johnny Ivey said, when's the last time Apple ever had a real product, which, of course, the real uh, significant product is is probably the iPad or the iPhone. Um, but could you argue, Keith, that these new initiatives in buying NFL or um, or Champions League football, that that is essentially for Apple the new iPhone? Well, it, it, it's their services business. Uh, so Apple yeah, has but that's their new iPhone. Is for them its services. Yeah, I, I think services. So we shouldn't be like, waiting for the Apple Car or the Apple Virtual Reality set. They've already got their eyes fixed on content. Well, they they do they do both. They they lead with um, they lead with hardware, and then they if it's successful, they build content and other services on top of it. By the way, the most interesting thing at the worldwide developer conference that they did was the software for cars, uh, uh, CarPlay, um, as, is, is going to be expanded to take over the entire dashboard of the cars that you use it in. So the, the, the in-car, even the speedometer and everything is going to be run by Apple. So basically, the Apple car is going to be any car. Mm. Quite an achievement for a little startup company. And what about Tweet of the Week, Keith? Another fairly unknown startup entrepreneur. Irresistible, this one. I, I don't know if you agree with me, Andrew, but I couldn't resist it. Uh, this is after he was served a lawsuit by Twitter for reneging on acquiring them, where they're going to try and force him to go through with it. Um, he tweeted this. Uh, and his facial gestures are the best. They said I couldn't buy Twitter, haha. -ha. Then they wouldn't disclose the info, haha. -ha. Now they want to force me to buy Twitter. And if you click into it, you'll see that bottom one says, and now they're going to have to disclose the info in the, in the court case that they wouldn't show in the otherwise. Sorry. So um, this, is, this is, yeah, more evidence that Musk is actually a 14-year-old adolescent. But something, he's more than that because he knows what he's doing, right? Oh, he knows what he's doing. But his sense of humor is naughty, mischievous, and couldn't care less-ish. And uh, my sense is already Twitter is in his rear view mirror. He doesn't care. He's moving on to the next thing. He He's not going to get fine. I mean, at most, he may be fined a little bit, and that will be it, right? Yep. 
Exactly. And what's it going to do for Twitter? Is it going to have any long-term impact? In a year's time, are we going to remember this? You know, I'm, I, I don't really want to predict because with the American legal system, anything could happen. You mean um, you'll get sued for predicting? I, I, I won't get screwed, but anything could happen in terms food, of... Food, not screwed. Oh, oh, food. They could force him to buy it. He could force them uh, to be sued by the SEC for giving misinformation on their earnings calls and anything in between. So uh, I'm not going to call it. But one thing for sure is it's not going to be a marriage and it won't be happy. Yeah. Well, he's been his father's. Did you read about his father? He should have been the startup of the world. His father having a child with his step granddaughter. Stepdaughter. Stepdaughter. <laughs> It's quite a family. Uh, I mean, they definitely have out Kardashian the Kardashians. It, actually, I had no clue that his father was like that. So uh, I didn't even I, know he had a father. I guess everyone has a father somewhere. It suddenly puts him in a different, you know, a different context because um, the minute you read about his father, now he looks like he's repeating quite a few things that his father. Yeah, he seems uh, like a mini, a mini. Uh, what was his name? Errol, appropriately named. Perhaps yeah, you should sign yeah. them both up to Manchester United, Keith. Errol and Elon Musk. I would definitely take Elon as an owner of Manchester United. If he, if you know, for he could buy Manchester United for you know a tenth of the price he was prepared to pay for Twitter, and it'd be a lot more fun. Yeah, and it'd be fun for him, but it'd be fun for everyone else. Well, that was the week for July the 15th. Not a hugely consequential week, but interesting in the long term. I think um, on Truth, on Network Society, uh, lots of things happening. Uh, I won't be around next week, Keith. You'll probably do it on your own, but I will see you all in a couple of weeks. Have a good summer, everyone. I'm off to Europe. Uh, hopefully, I won't be uh, cooked alive. You're going to enjoy, Andrew. My wife's just coming back from a week in Corsica, and uh, she told me it's stunning right now over there. I'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.